Good evening and welcome to tonight's K. Malmstrom Lecture in Physics. Uh, we are here on the roof of Robin Science Center where the Hamlin Physics Department is located. We would like to give you a brief tour of some of our facilities, some of which are closely related to tonight's lecture. Normally by this time of the year in Minnesota, we've had a bit of snow. Now you might ask, Josh, don't solar panels work less efficiently in snowy regions? To which I'd say yes, that's correct. However, this project aims to tackle that challenge. It's funded by a grant won in 2016 in the United States Environmental Protection Agency's People, Prosperity, and the Planet Student Design Challenge. It compares the energy output of controlled solar panel with a modified solar panel with a super hydrophobic surface. It also aims to determine which surfaces work best to remove snow from solar panels. Hamlin University has won this national award not once, but twice. The second project winning in 2020 aims to develop uh, affordable and reusable lead detection kits for drinking water. This research will be presented at the National Student Design Expo in the spring of 2021. These are just a few of the ways that Hamlin students apply their research to real world problems and serve the community. We also have a magneto optic Kerr effect apparatus, which is a device which is used to probe magnetic properties of materials in an external magnetic field. The apparatus was designed, ordered, and assembled by Hamlin physics majors as part of a summer research experience. This equipment utilizes several optical and electronic devices in order to measure the magnetization of a given sample. The students also developed new computational skills that allowed them to automate both the controlled variation of the external magnetic field and the measurements themselves. We are here in the dark room. This room acts as a laboratory hood, sucking up the fumes from the liquid coatings over here and circulating in fresh air from these ceiling vents. Because we work with chemicals in here, it's really important that this room is properly ventilated. The way we have our equipment set up here, we can deposit multiple layers on a surface. Over here, we have the spray coater. Because it is programmed by a computer, we can program it to run intricate patterns, uh, maybe even a, an electronic circuit, or even a tattoo design. Over here is the thermal evaporator, and with this machine, we can fabricate aluminum silver electrodes uh, by melting metal pellets into vapors, which are then guided to the coated material. An important function of these facilities is that they allow us to create flexible, multi-layered electronic devices. Because these machines don't require high temperatures to function, we can use thin and flexible materials such as paper, glass, and plastic. Imagine a patch on your palm that can monitor your heartbeat or vitals, or a prosthesis that can simulate the sense of touch with electronic skin. Have you ever noticed the way butterfly wings change color depending on your viewing angle? Or maybe you really admire the iridescence of opal. What you're observing in these instances are natural examples of photonic crystals. These are complex, multidimensional structures that tailor the color or direction of light that enter them. We model these structures for fabrication, which we do with lasers and light sensitive chemicals. These models allow us to tune these structures to change or absorb the light that enter them. The first beam here is split up into four different paths, which hit the structure on different sides. When the light comes in contact with the surface, it creates patterns of light and dark spots through photolithography processes. We use these structures in research projects related to solar cells, but they're also used in decorative paints which may only give off color in a particular light or angle. When you think of a solar cell, what comes to mind? Probably something along the lines of a large rectangular blue in color panel that you would see in a large field or on the top of your neighbor's home. These are silicon based and made with silicon cells. Some of our research here at Hamlin has been dedicated to the exploration of natural dye alternatives for these cells where we test the efficiency of different types of natural dyes. 
Some of them include blue pea, raspberries, turmeric, cherries, blackberries, passion tea, or even spinach. Hey, if you don't want to eat it, we're glad to use it for our research. The process that is going on here, essentially, when light hits the dye molecules, electrons are released. A similar process to photosynthesis. Beside me is our sun simulator. We use it to test our cells under specific solar conditions to test the effectiveness and the efficiency of each individual cell. In here, we can fabricate and test batteries and supercapacitors. We use this glove box station to assemble coin type lithium ion batteries with liquid electrolytes. If we built these in the open air, lithium can easily react with oxygen and water moisture. So this station is useful because it best provides a stable, argon-filled, moistureless environment in which we can assemble this type of battery. We can test lithium ion batteries and supercapacitors using these instruments to guide our experiments. In addition to research, it, you could also use these batteries and capacitors to power a device or vehicle in an engineering project. We also have built solid state thin film lithium ion batteries, which have solid electrolytes rather than liquid electrolytes. These have important potential applications for wearable electronics, implant medical devices, and smart cards. We could build them in our vacuum chambers, which use physical deposition methods called sputtering and thermal evaporation to transfer materials from a target to a substrate. We are very excited to talk about our brand new Environmental Scanning Electron Microscope, or SEM. This instrument has a much higher resolution than an optical microscope, using electron beams to analyze minuscule samples. Different signals generated by electron beams are processed via different detectors, and these are to provide high resolution images and compositional analysis of the samples. The lateral resolution is 3 nanometers. One nanometer is one thousandth of one micrometer. And a human hair is dimensioned in the tens of micrometers. Its potential for analysis means that it can be applied in, to any number of fields beyond just physics. It could be used in forensics, examining gunshot residue, comparing hair fibers, or in toxicology. What's more is that you can use this environmental SEM to examine fresh organic samples, such as leaves, flower petals, and butterfly wings, in their natural state without coating an electrical conducting film. It can also be applied in material science research to discover new materials in the fields of pharmacology and semiconductors, as well as to optimize manufacturing processes through device failure analysis. The physics department is very fortunate to have many generous donors. There are a number of scholarships and awards for our students that allow us to recruit and educate some of the best and brightest students. Some students would have never been able to afford to come to Hamlin were it not for your generous donations. Thank you ever so much for all that you have done. And especially as of late, we wish to give a special thank you to those of you who have provided the funds that have allowed us to purchase a state-of-the-art environmental scanning electron microscope. This will provide a research and learning experience for not only students in physics, but also for all departments at Hamlin campus-wide. One of our most generous donors is the reason that we are here this evening, namely Carl Malmstrom. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge and honor Carl Malmstrom who, after the passing of his wife, Emma K. Malmstrom, endowed this lecture series as a tribute to her and the life that they spent together. Prior to his passing in 2010 at the age of 97, Carl was a constant fixture at this annual event. Let me say a little bit about Carl. He was a physics and mathematical major here in Hamlin's class of 1936 and received his master's degree in physics from Syracuse University in 1938. Carl's early scientific career was interrupted by conflict as he served as a naval aviator in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Following the war, Carl put his physics degree fully to work, serving with the Atomic Energy Department and later with the Atomic Energy Commission. 
He was very highly regarded within the physics community throughout his career and made a number of very significant contributions. Carl endowed this lecture as a way of not only honoring his wife, Emma K. Malmstrom, but as a way to give back to Hamlin community by providing us with a means to bring to campus some of the best scientific minds in the world. We have welcomed many great scientists over these 28 years and have given students, our faculty, and the public the opportunity to talk with and learn from them. We honor Carl for his personal and generous gifts to Hamlin and celebrate his legacy by coming together to learn today as we will continue to do for many years to come. Please join me in honoring Carl Malmstrom. Good evening. Welcome to 29th Annual K Memtron Lecture in Physics at Hamlin University. We are very proud of our science program at Hamlin. We attract and educate outstanding students who go on to do great things as exemplified by individuals like Carl Memtron. One of the many things that distinguish our program is the opportunity we provide students to work closely with faculty who are dedicated to helping them develop their interests and skill to the fullest extent. For more information about our department, facilities, research opportunity, and much more, please visit our website. It's great honor to have Dr. Francis M. Russ as the 29th NUK Memtron Lecture Speaker tonight. Dr. Russ received her Bachelor of Arts in Physics and PhD in Material Science from Cambridge University. Her postdoc was at AT&T Bell Lab, using in-situ electron microscopy to study silicon oxidation and dislocation dynamic. Then she joined the National Center for Electron Microscopy at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to study processes such as anodic etching of silicon using electron microscopy. After three years, she moved to the IBM Thomas Watson Research Center, where she imaged the growth of nanoscale materials using a microscope with deposition and focused ion beam capabilities. She joined the Department of Material Science and Engineering at MIT in 2018 as the Ellen Swaller Richard Professor. Her research continued to center on nanostructure self-assembling, liquid cell microscopy, epitaxy, and electrochemical processes. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ross. Hello, my name is Francis Ross and I'm at MIT. I'm really delighted and honored to have this chance to talk about microscopy in motion at the Malmstrom Lecture. And thanks so much for the opportunity. What I'd like to do is share the joys of doing microscopy in motion, uh, recording videos of crystal growth and using the results to understand the physics underlying the processes that are involved. <coughs> These are the sorts of movies that I'm going to be talking about. Um, in the first one, you can see a catalyst at work. It's a liquid droplet. On the surface is a nanoscale structure, and this structure um, strongly affects the catalytic performance of this droplet um, as it converts disilane gas into a silicon crystal that you can see beneath. In this, motion, in this movie, we can see small gold triangular islands resting on a graphene surface. And as we warm them up, you can see that the, um, the positions of these islands change. They can rotate. There's very weak bonding between the metal and the 2D material. And this has strong implications for electronic uh, properties of the types of uh, devices that we can make with 2D materials. And finally, in this movie, you can see action in a liquid. Here's a nucleation site for nanoscale bubbles. You can see them forming, the hydrogen bubbles forming, moving through the liquid as they grow, and a repeated process going on, which is uh, relevant to, for example, catalysis, uh, cavitation, and uh, corrosion. 
So look again at the length scales involved, going from 100 nanometers all the way down to uh, 1 or 2 nanometers. Uh, these movies can show us processes in a way that's unique, uh, can't really be achieved using other imaging techniques. And what I'm going to do is, talk, of course, I'll talk about the science, but also um, I hope you'll see things that are surprising, um, maybe amusing. And we also find that often the failures are quite informative. So it's not just a question of dry collection of data, but it's a lot of fun doing these kinds of experiments. The work I'm going to show is a collaboration with efforts from a lot of different people uh, from IBM, where I used to work, and MIT, where I work now. And I really would love to acknowledge all of the people who contributed here, the students, postdocs, uh, and uh, advisors who I've had the pleasure of working with uh, over the uh, several years. So what's the motivation for watching crystals grow? Um, one of the grand challenges in material science is to design and build materials with specific and useful properties. These could be electronic, mechanical, magnetic, optical, or other properties. And when we're looking for materials with the correct properties, we often use nanoscience. This provides new tools for achieving the goal because shrinking the size of a material often unlocks new properties. So how do we make nanoscale materials? Well, there's one very precise way, we could move each atom into its exact location. So here's an example from IBM where a scanning tunneling microscope was used to move an array, individually move iron atoms into this beautiful uh, structure, uh, which was imaged later with the STM. This is the world's smallest magnetic bit. And it took many hours to create, uh, obviously not a scalable way for making a computer components. So this is like a top-down um, deliberate assembly of a, of a nanostructure, but what's much more practical in the real world is self-assembly, where many nanostructures spontaneously assemble all at once without us having to direct the atoms um, individually. So you can see this all the time in real life. Um, here's an example. Whenever the rain falls on the windows in our lab, um, it spontaneously forms hemispherical droplets. We don't have to tell the water to do that. It's driven to do that by uh, minimizing its surface uh, tension, so uh, surface area. So it's a self-assembly process that has produced a lot of very simple structures easily and all at once. And that's a real comparison with this process, which produced very few very complicated structures one at a time. So here's the question, can we use the simple techniques of the simple processes of self-assembly, but can we use them to build complicated structures? I'd like to illustrate how we can control self-assembly by analogy with the behavior of cats. So as you know, if you have any experience with cats, you can't expect them to go where you want them to just by chance. But here's a movie that I recorded which shows how we can control the behavior of cats. We simply set up a situation where just by chance the cats would like to go where you want them to go. So this is the principle that we would like to use to control self-assembly. Um, set up a situation where the atoms naturally go where you want them to go. And this can, it should be simple because the atoms follow straightforward physical principles like reducing the total energy. So what we need to do is understand the physics underlying the self-assembly process and use that knowledge to uh, control the self-assembly process by tuning up the conditions. So in situ electron microscopy is a very useful tool in doing this, uh, this job. Um, in situ imaging can help us understand and control self-assembly because it helps us to track the pathways of the component elements and measure how the external variables like temperature, uh, gas composition and pressure, etc. can control the growth. If we do this, we can at least generate design rules to improve uniformity, but more 
uh, excitingly, we can perhaps uh, uh, obtain fundamental kinetic and thermodynamic insights. We could maybe see new growth modes that we hadn't expected to see. We could create new types of structure that we hadn't formed uh, before doing these experiments. So this is a pretty exciting prospect, uh, uh, even in normal times, but it happens that we're in a very special moment. Uh, electron microscopy is advancing really quickly in terms of the hardware and uh, the way that we can analyze the data. So we have developments in imaging tools and we can apply these new tools to accelerate the ongoing progress, which is also at a, a very high speed in the discovery use and integration of new materials. So um, here's the... Um, Here's a, a photograph of the microscope that, that is used in many of the experiments that I'm going to show you uh, today. So here's the electron microscope itself. The electrons are emitted from the source here. They pass through a sample. They get imaged through the projector lenses, and then we record the information uh, on a camera goes to a, a computer hard drive. So the microscope allows us to uh, prepare samples in one of these side chambers um, to clean them up, to insert them in the microscope, to flow gases, heat the sample, and therefore make a video of a process taking place on the sample. So we can do a number of different things in this with this kind of equipment. I should point out, look how many knobs and buttons and controls there are. This is really more like playing a musical instrument than just running a science experiment as you sit there kind of deciding what to do at each moment. Should I heat it up? Should I change the magnification? Should I <clears throat> should I flow more gas? Um, so it's really it's 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 much more like a, um, a, a human endeavor than you would think. You don't simply push a button and wait for the results. So there are two kinds of experiments that we do using this type of equipment. One of them is flowing gases over a sample, often flammable and toxic gases. So we have to thank our safety team for uh, paying attention to all of this. Um, alternatively, I'll show you experiments done using thin closed containers called liquid cells, which are filled with water or other liquids uh, to look at uh, liquid phase crystal growth. The sample cartridge uh, is, is a couple of inches long, and here's a photo of it. And the samples themselves are typically uh, silicon-based, small chips that uh, we can insert into the cartridge to, uh, to start the experiment. So the, I'm going to show you three examples of in situ uh, electron microscope movies. And the first area that I'd like to talk about is the topic of nanowire growth. And this is a uh, an experiment where we use a catalyst to grow a nanostructure. It gives us a lot more control and a lot more capabilities to grow complex nanostructures compared to simply um, to, 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 to many other uh, techniques. And it's certainly a case where if you understand the growth fundamentals, this can help to create more complex structures. So here's the process. I'll show you the movie straight away. Um, this is speeded up, uh, but otherwise is just a straight movie recorded in the microscope. And what you see is a catalyst. Um, you see behind it is a crystal of silicon that's being grown. Um, the silicon is arriving as a gas phase, uh, sticking onto the surface of the catalyst, diffusing through and then being deposited at the interface here. So this is the real life experiment. This is the PowerPoint view of what goes on. We start with a gas disilane. Uh, it impinges on a catalytic droplet, which is made of silicon and gold. Um, it decomposes, leaving the silicon behind on the surface. The hydrogen goes away. Um, the silicon diffuses through the droplet and deposits at the interface. As it deposits, the nanowire grows longer, but the catalyst stays on the surface. So we end up with a perfect single crystal of silicon. Um, <clears throat> and just to give a context of how the, the experimental geometry works, these posts of silicon are growing out sideways. Um, the electron beam comes down from the top. As the nanowires grow out sideways from the silicon uh, chip that, that they rest on, uh, you get a really good view of them all growing out like little trees or maybe little mushrooms out into the vacuum of the microscope. 
So we can do a lot of things with this type of experiment. I'm firstly going to show you a movie recorded at, at higher magnification than the one I just showed. So in this movie, the, the little dot pattern here is the individual uh, atomic structure of the silicon that's growing. You can see a few defects in the structure. You can see, most importantly, the growth of the silicon at the interface. Do you see that it's happening in jumps? It's kind of a pulsing motion. So even though the material is being added uh, at a constant rate from the gas phase, we still have this kind of pulsing growth. Um, if I show you the same thing at higher magnification, uh, you can see exactly how that happens. Nothing for a while, nothing, nothing, nothing until and there. It all grew in one layer pretty much almost at once. If I grow other materials like gallium arsenide, which we can grow by flowing uh, trimethyl gallium and arsine, you see a very different kinetics. Um, you actually see very gradual motion of the step. Do you see it there just at the interface? It's a bit hard to make out, but the step is flowing back and forth across the interface, increasing the length of the nanowire each time. Into We don't want to go in a lot into the physics, the details of the physics here, but it's fairly clear that the um, kinetics that we measure in these movies, the way that the steps move across the interface during the growth of the nanowire gives us some fundamental information about the important parameters uh, of the catalyst and the nanowire, such as the solubility of the growth material. Uh, it gives us information about how to control the sharpness of the interface and especially how to control uh, the, the structure when you happen to change the gas that's flowing in. So a lot of detailed physical insight um, comes from doing these kinds of atomically resolved movies of the process taking place. So one, uh, you know, it's, it's all very well to grow a silicon nanowire um, that's a pure silicon single crystal like this one here, but it's not that interesting electronically. So the real uses of nanowires come from uh, creating more complicated structures where we change uh, the gas as we um, as we continue to grow. So let's say we started by flowing silicon. Uh, in the first picture here, we're growing a silicon nanowire. That's all very well. Let's switch off the silicon gas, switch on gas that has germanium in it. And what we'll see is that the germanium now comes in. It, it moves through the catalyst. It gets deposited at the nanowire. And so we've formed a junction. We formed a structure that can be arbitrarily complex formed of silicon and germanium. So this is the reason that nanowire growth is such an exciting topic, because it's possible to make complicated heterostructures by changing the incoming gas and seeing the result uh, modulated in the nanowire as it grows. So this is all very well. And we tried some experiments creating these junctions and felt kind of pleased with ourselves for doing that. We tried a different experiment where instead of growing silicon and then germanium, we started growing silicon and then nickel. Our objective was to grow nickel silicide, which would act as a contact, is very commonly used in microelectronics. But something pretty unexpected happened, and this illustrates some of the um, the, the, ha the, the excitement of doing these experiments, you never really know what's going to happen. It starts as you'd expect. You can see the catalyst sitting here. But as we add the nickel, we get these structures forming within the droplet of catalyst. You can see them here. I had to draw a box around it because it's actually a little hard to make out. So what's happened is a small crystal formed within the catalyst. Let's stop growing nickel uh, and then start growing silicon again. And now the nanowire itself is growing. The little particle is stuck at the interface where, where it formed. And you can see the nanowire is growing around it. So it looks like it's floating like an ice cube in a drink. And then we continue growing and it's get left behind in the nanowire. So we've created a single um, quantum dot within a nanowire using a growth mode that you certainly wouldn't have expected to happen. And um, and that it would have been very difficult to explain without having a movie showing the whole process from start to end. 
So we can expand our map of structures. We, we don't simply have the capability of growing these lat these planar uh, junctions. We can also grow these small particles uh, into the nanowire and uh, create much more complex uh, functions, functional structures, perhaps. So I don't want to leave you with the impression that all the experiments work out perfectly and that you always see something unexpected or, uh, or unpredicted. Uh, we often get a case where things don't work. We, we publish the good ones, but, but uh, you often see things like this, the sample gets so dirty for some reason, the, the vacuum system's not working right, the morphology is messed up, things bend over and, or grow sideways. But and and every so often we could see that the nanowires would be losing their catalyst. See the catalyst on the end of this one is shrinking away and it's eventually going to disappear. And you see that the uh, nanowire now can't grow anymore. So you might say, well, that's something of a failure. But it ended up that this concept that the catalyst is not kind of a steady fixed object is fundamental to controlling nanowire growth. And this turned out to be one of the more popular um, results that we got from this whole project. So, so a failure turned into a success. That was, uh, that was something happy in this whole thing. Right. So the second example I'd like to share with you is, uh, is based on the idea of 2D materials. And this beautiful um, uh, figure from the cover of a journal shows a lot of different types of 2D materials. Uh, the, the thing that, lim that links them all together uh, is that these are single sheets or few sheets of atoms. They're strongly bonded within the plane, but they stacked up in a crystal with very weak bonding between the sheets so that you can easily peel them apart. Um, these materials, uh, thousands of them exist with different elements and different crystal structures, um, have all kinds of interesting unexpected properties. Um, and so these are really one of the most exciting areas in physics and material science uh, at the moment. So 2D materials are interesting in themselves, but what if you stack up the layers so that they're slightly misaligned? So you do that by twisting them. And this turns out to unlock uh, really unexpected properties. The most um, well-known of them is that uh, you can get superconductivity in materials just by setting a, an exact twisting angle between two sheets of uh, the same two-dimensional graphene uh, material. So, so uh, we have a huge variety of properties that are accessible by tuning up the layers themselves and the twist between uh, different layers. So our interest was in the interface between 2D materials and 3D materials. So for example, a, th a 3D material would be something like gold. Um, these are gold islands on, uh, and the 2D material could be something like graphene, hexagonal boron nitride, or molybdenum disulfide, which is the one shown in this image. So we have a, a sheet of material, and we have a, quote, 3D material grown on top of it. When we put these two materials together, we get the same kinds of effects as you get with the twisting uh, that I showed you in the previous slide. So the lattice of one material on top of the second material, um, they have a kind of interference beating phenomenon where you get this long, longer period moiré pattern um, caused by the difference in rotation or lattice spacing between the atoms. So in the same way that um, creating interfaces between different 2D materials is interesting, we want to see what would happen if we create uh, interfaces between a 2D and a 3D material. We do that in our same microscope with a somewhat different sample geometry from the one I showed you before. So here's a gold island, and it's being grown on a suspended sheet of a 2D material that we create by placing the 2D material over a hole on a uh, silicon um, substrate. 
<coughs> when we started doing these experiments, we were um, we were quite uh, impressed by how sensitive the results are to how clean the interfaces are. And the reason is that there's very weak bonding between the 3D and the 2D material. So they're not very well stuck down. It doesn't take much to disturb them. If you grow gold on thin molybdenum disulfide, you often get these messy blobby objects. Um, on the other hand, if you make a big effort to clean the surface of the 2D material, um, here we're doing it by annealing it in vacuum. You get very different structures. You get perfect triangles of gold that are all pointing in the same direction. So e each of these gold islands um, is aligned with the with the with the lattice of the 2D material. If you grow thicker gold on thicker molybdenum disulfide, you can see these moiré patterns very clearly again. Uh, caused by the difference between the two lattice uh, parameters. And finally, you can get uh, even thicker ones that show almost, uh, you know, increasing coverage of gold. Uh, again, all the gold is aligned in the same direction. So we were pretty pleased with these uh, with these kinds of images, we thought, okay, we finally got this thing to work. We can start doing things with it now. And at that point, we started to look through some of the literature uh, on these. And this is a, this this shows a couple of frames from a video from a paper that was published in the 70s uh, from the group of Takianagi. They didn't have the concept of 2D materials. They called this stuff molybdenite, but they grew gold on it and they got the exact same structures as we have here. So this is such a, a pioneering uh, uh, effort that um, I just want to point out that, ev you know, everything you think is new, um, <laughs> you can often find such stuff uh, in, in the past. <clears throat> so what's interesting about these moray patterns is that the structure of them seems to be unclear. You would think that you know the structure of gold, you know the structure of MOS2, what could go wrong? Um, and yet, if we measure the spacing between the moray patterns in transmission electron microscopy, and we measure it in scanning tunneling microscopy, we get different results. And the reason is that STM here is measuring the electronic properties of the sample, whereas TEM is measuring the structural properties of a projection through the sample as the electrons pass through the thin. <coughs> So after, so it seems somehow obvious in retrospect, but it did take us a very long time to convince ourselves that the reason that the techniques give different results is that um, STM is telling us something about the electronic structure of the uh, material. And so it really is sensitive to just the first um, atomic layer of gold on the MOS2, whereas in, electro in transmission electron microscopy, you project through all of the different layers of gold, and the symmetry of the resulting thing is different, and so the moiré pattern shows up with a different periodicity. And we can um, use this uh, knowledge of the three-dimensional structure to make calculations of the effect we expect this to have on the electronic properties. So I've shown you one instance where we could make perfect a perfect interface between gold and different 2D materials. And we've understood details of the structure and the electronic properties. But we need to do more because all devices like these ones here that involve a 2D material uh, are ultimately connected to the three-dimensional world. So we really have to uh, have a general strategy for controlling a, a, an, any interface between any 2D material and any um, three-dimensional material. So I'm going to show you um, some examples of how we can expand the work I've shown for gold on uh, 2D materials into other uh, combinations. So let's start with germanium, a, an important material. Germanium doesn't want to grow well on graphene. If we deposit germanium on graphene, we get this ugly mess that I'm showing here, polycrystalline, uh, randomly oriented uh, little uh, lumps of germanium. 
But we know from our nanowire experiments that gold acts as a catalyst to grow germanium or, or silicon nanowires, as I showed in some of those previous movies. So let's use solid gold triangles that we created uh, in the last few slides and use them to grow germanium. And I have to show, say this is one of the least interesting movies that I've, that, that we've uh, taken, but look specifically at this corner of this triangle and the same corner of the other triangle, right here goes, very much speeded up because it was slow. Do you see that there? That's the nucleation of the germanium on the gold triangle. Um, there should be another one coming. There it, there it goes. Do you see that? Very much speeded up. This was quite a slow and boring experiment, but it did work in the end. And after some time, you end up with this rather beautiful structure. Here's the original um, gold. It's been distorted a bit, but it's still aligned with the substrate. And here's the germanium that has grown from the gold. Again, a single crystal, a perfect crystal that is well aligned with the substrate. So Gold acts as a catalyst uh, because the gold is lined up on the surface and the germanium is lined up with the gold, then the germanium is lined up with the surface. So we'd like to do this also for silicon, but gold doesn't work that well for silicon because you can't grow at low enough temperatures. We'd like to use silver instead, but silver doesn't grow epitaxial on graphene. So now we have to do a chain with more links. We firstly grow gold. This works perfectly and makes its little triangles. We use the gold as a template to grow silver. Silver covers the gold and shares its crystal orientation. We then use the gold and silver uh, as a catalyst in order to grow silicon, and we get uh, aligned growth of silicon on the substrate. So here we have a, a, a longer chain where gold is lined up with the surface, silver lines up with the gold, and then silicon lines up with the silver, so that the silicon ends up uh, aligned with the 2D surface. So there's a lot of different combinations that would be possible, and we can make some good guesses based on nanowire experiments that uh, similar to what I showed you before, where <clears throat> we use the catalyst, here's the droplet of the catalyst in the nanowire, as a way to grow a little crystal. Uh, that little crystal floats around, sticks on the surface, but now the surface would not be silicon, it would be a 2D material. And there could be some pretty entertaining uh, possibilities uh, from uh, trying out different uh, materials. So we can use nanowire physics to help us grow materials, uh, 3D materials on 2D. Uh, so the last example I'd like to talk about is liquid phase crystal growth. I hope I've convinced you that the experiments where we flow gases or we deposit metals onto a solid sample give really unique information about processes of crystal growth and catalysis. So can we extend these kinds of experimental techniques to let us see phenomena that take place in liquids like water? And the big problem with imaging liquids in the microscope is that the uh, a liquid like water, as soon as it goes into the microscope, is going to evaporate into the vacuum of the microscope. So we need to protect the water from the vacuum, and we also need to form it into a thin, stable liquid layer that's thin enough to see through with the electrons. So what we want to do then is trap a thin layer of water in between two silicon nitride windows. These are very robust, um, thin windows, the electrons can pass through them. So uh, when we do the experiment, we have electrons going through the microscope. They go through the top window, through a thin layer of liquid, out through the bottom window, and then back out into the vacuum. We can improve the functionality, the capabilities of this liquid cell by adding uh, electrodes so that we can do electrochemical reactions, by adding a uh, capability to flow liquid through the gap, and also by adding capabilities to heat or cool the liquid while it's being observed. So all of these things allow us to image reactions in water or other liquids uh, through a little window. Looks a bit like this from, 
from the top um, and to record movies of these processes as they take place with a resolution that you can't get using light microscopy um, and at a speed that you can't do using scanning probe techniques. All right. So that's the technique uh, as, a, as a happy PowerPoint slide. In real life, it's a lot messier. This is a photo of one of the earlier liquid cells from uh, now a while ago. Uh, the success rate was 5%. It was a very frustrating time to be doing the experiments. But now you can, uh, you can get much better reliable liquid cells. You can buy them commercially along with a holder that, that that keeps them all together, that have very sophisticated capabilities, uh, allowing um, liquid flow, heating, uh, or biasing. So I'm going to show you a couple of, uh, of uh, movies recorded using this technique. And this first one is the deposition of copper uh, from an electrolyte, so electrochemical deposition. And what you can see in the movie is that these black blobs, gray blobs are forming. They may not look that great, but what we have here is a real-time view of an electrochemical reaction. There are copper ions in solution, copper sulfate ion, uh, uh, solution. Um, we apply a voltage. The copper ions land on an electrode, which we're looking through here, made of gold. Um, they form little clusters. And the, the fun thing about these is that you simultaneously get the image of the result and the electrochemical measurement that is associated with it. So you're measuring through the whole cell, the current and voltage, and you're recording a movie, and you can combine those images to get a really deep insight into the uh, physical processes that take place, even during a well-known process like deposition of copper from an acidified electrode. Here's another example where we're using it to to look at a process that's much more like the uh, much more relevant to the uh, cycling of batteries. So rechargeable batteries, um, you redeposit metal on an electrode on each cycle uh, in in many designs, and then you strip it off as you discharge the battery. Here's a movie of the process of um, of deposition, and what you can see is that the material being deposited starts out kind of growing in a fairly flat way, but you, you see these dendrites forming later on. And if these get too long, they can short out the other side of the battery and create a, a real problem. So the way in which the surface changes from kind of flat to very spiky, that's the onset of instability, is highly relevant to designing battery charging uh, protocols. Again, it's possible to, to take information from these movies. Here we have the position of the growth front at every moment in a movie, and to use that to poke around into the physics of the deposition process, the, the pathway that the ions come and, and which is the slowest step in the whole process, and how particularly how can we suppress the formation of these spiky structures that uh, cause so much trouble in real batteries. But we can also use liquid cell microscopy to study other important techniques. This is corrosion of a thin aluminium film in salt water. So it's a much simpler experiment. You deposit a, a, a thin layer of aluminium, and here's one piece of that film, one single grain. We, <coughs> we can uh, flow in some salt water and just wait for a few hours. And you see all these little white spots here. These are pits. The aluminium has been etched away. So we've removed material. And we can look at where this pitting starts and how quickly it proceeds uh, during the corrosion process. Um, this is the this process of addition of material. Here we have metal ions in solution. And we're depositing them onto a single nucleation uh, site. And you can see the really interesting a spiky uh, structure of the of the uh, this is gold as it grows during the experiment. So liquid cell microscopy can be a lot of fun. Uh, one of the first things you do with with any new technique is see if you can write the name of your 
collaborating institutions. So we were working with University of Pennsylvania. Uh, we moved, we used this uh, material deposition technique, moving the beam across in order to deposit material in a pattern. And we were able to form these letters, nanoscale letters. Um, we ended up publishing this, this in a journal called Nano Letters, so that was quite uh, entertaining for us. But as soon as th these were evidently not very well stuck to the substrate, because as soon as a bubble passed by, all of the letters got broken off and scrambled around. So, so uh, I'm not sure, so that they clearly have some strength in their own cells, but they're not well stuck on the substrate. So I think that's all I'll say about liquid cell microscopy. Um, I've shown you three examples now. I've shown you how nanocrystals can be self-assembled using catalytic droplets to create quite complicated structures. I've shown you how we can understand some of the details of the interfaces between 2D materials like graphene and 3D conventional materials like gold. And I've shown you how electrochemical processes and generally liquid phase processes of crystal growth can be imaged and quantified in the electron microscope, giving a con and, and these three examples give uh, some of the key things about this microscopy, a continuous view under real conditions, detailed kinetic information, and looking at uh, and seeing unexpected structures as we do the experiments. So for the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about what may happen next. What are the prospects for this type of microscopy? And I see three different, uh, three general areas where we're evolving. I'll just talk about um, two, two of them. Um, firstly, new sample and holder designs that increase the range of processes that we can study. And secondly, improving our control over the environment so that we can get more quantitative uh, information. So most of the experiments I've shown have been carried out on relatively simple samples, um, a flat surface perhaps, or a um, or a, a thin sheet of liquid, it's possible to have a much more complicated type of sample. Here is one of those samples. It consists of two silicon loops uh, that can be heated by flowing current through them. Uh, there's a little gap in between them, and you can apply a voltage between the two sides so that you get quite a strong, well, uh, something of an electric field in between the two sides. And this movie shows that an electric field can have quite a, an interesting effect on nanowire growth. This nanowire would normally just keep growing straight, but we've applied a strong electric field in this direction. Uh, it's pulling the liquid drop around, and as it pulls it, uh, the, the growth of the nanowire becomes asymmetrical and it starts to change its direction. So we can tune up the direction of these catalytic growth processes using an electric field and we can wave our arms and talk about creating specific structures for maybe quantum uh, applications using the ability to change the direction of the nanowires. And so uh, a weakness of, uh, let's say a central aspect of all of these experiments is quantification. If I want to say that I've learned something about the physics of a process, um, it's really important that I understand what the parameters were. What was the temperature? How clean was the surface? Was there any contamination in the background that could affect the results? Um, so control of the environment is really essential for creating for, for many aspects of these experiments. And one of them is for creating and maintaining clean surfaces. And another is for um, observations of reactive metals. So, uh, so earlier on, I showed you example of gold growth where the surface needed to be clean in order to get decent, um, well-aligned epitaxial growth. Um, here's an experiment where we're growing a material, niobium, which oxidizes very readily. And so only by having very good vacuum within the microscope can we be sure that the images we see represent the real material and not just some contaminated version of it. If you have good control over the environment, you also can use that for more interesting things. 
having a clean surface means that if you deliberately disturb the surface, for example, by cutting little holes in it, you are quite likely to affect the nucleation of the islands. So if the surface was dirty, there would be so many possible nucleation sites that nothing would change. If the surface is clean, these sites become the most, the best place for islands to nucleate so that we can control their position and structure by drilling little holes in the surface before we do the growth experiment. And this allows for all kinds of applications where we want an array of particular structures, each equally spaced, or, um, or we want to write a pattern that has uh, connections and gaps in it. And so let me conclude by saying that I feel like the, the path ahead is really exciting. Um, we've seen that there are many ways in which simple self-assembly processes can be tuned up to make much more complicated structures than you might expect uh, using various tricks of, um, of uh, crystal growth and tuning of the environment uh, in the microscope. So we have, um, we have the interest and the need to grow these kinds of materials. But at the same time, we have developments in imaging tools that allow us to do much more uh, complicated and uh, accurate experiments. Um, quantification is still a challenge, but so many things are coming together to improve the capabilities of these kinds of experiments. So it's a very exciting time to be doing microscopy in motion. And um, I'm, I hope that uh, that maybe some of you will choose this topic uh, in future research, or at least think about what kinds of information it could provide that would be useful for you. And I'm very happy to discuss this further and take any questions. Great. All right. Yeah. That Thank is you. great. Thank you. We do have some questions for you. Is sure. How do you get interest in, in situ electron microscopy? Um, I think that if you enjoy taking pictures, and so seeing visually how something looks is, is a really exciting and stimulating thing, then going from single images to movies is a logical step. So it's it's great to take pictures and it's even better to take movies. So that's how you end up saying, OK, this is what I'd like to do is uh, put my sample in the microscope and do something to it so that it changes and and uh, generates new structures and measuring it at the same time. So putting all of that together leads, you know, directly to doing in situ experiments. Thank you. Yeah. So is there a reason? why the gold triangles form in the same direction? Yes, yes, there is. And I didn't give too many um, details of the crystal structures involved. But if you think about the surface that they're sitting on, the 2D material, it has a kind of hexagonal symmetry to it. So the structure of graphene looks like chicken wire. It has little carbon atoms arranged, <coughs> arranged in hexagons. So that structure has the symmetry where it looks the same if you rotate it by 120 degrees. Now, the gold crystal has a similar kind of symmetry if you cut it in a diagonal direction. So if you place the gold on the graphene or the boron nitride or the molybdenum disulfide, they all have similar symmetry. It naturally wants the atomic positions to line up. Um, it wants, I'm saying it wants to do that. The, the real reason is that it's the lowest energy configuration if all the atoms are as close as possible uh, together. So there's a slight preference for it to go in one direction rather than another one. And so because the gold 
islands like to be triangular, again, because the surface has the lowest energy, they, they naturally form as triangles, then you end up with a situation where every triangle is pointing in the same direction because it's seeing the structure of the um, thin layer that it's sitting on. So it's interesting. In the microscope, you don't see what's going on on the substrate. You just get this kind of gray background. But you can see that every triangle is pointing in the same direction. So they're all talking to the substrate and they're all talking to the same thing. So they're all in the same direction. Great. Thank you. Yeah. A related question. How do you know the silicon diffuses inside the gold in nanoparticles? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So that's, that's a very um, interesting and complicated question because as with the previous question, there's things you see clearly in the movies, but there are also things that you don't see. Uh, you don't see the gas coming in. You don't see the directly the composition of the droplet. You just see that it's a liquid. So the way that we know which pathway the atoms are taking is by measuring how this process behaves differently if, for example, you change the pressure or the temperature, or if you look at a nanowire growing that has a different diameter. So if you combine all of that information and you have in your head a model for how you think the pathway of the atoms is, you can match it up with what you see. So what could be the possibilities? You say to yourself, it could come to the surface and then diffuse through the gas, through, sorry, through the liquid droplet. Or it could come to the surface and it could go around until it gets to the interface and then it could kind of join in from the side. Or it could come from the bottom and come up the side of the nanowires. Each one of those different possibilities would lead to a different type of, um, of uh, dependence of the growth rate or the shape or the, the behavior on something, some parameter like pressure, temperature, or diameter. And so we can eliminate the models that don't fit, and then we end up with a, a fairly convincing proof that we know the correct model, even without seeing the individual atoms doing their behavior. So that means you do have a lot of assumptions. I think related with this question is uh, one question said, I would love to hear more about the struggle the struggles your team had when it seemed that STM and the TEM were disagreeing. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I I think that when we publish papers, we somehow always explain things as if it was obvious. We say, okay, look, here's here's an observation, here's another one. The the difference between them is this, and we can work out we can explain why they're different. But um, as as you all know in the audience, real life isn't like the presentation. It's not like the final story. So you, what happened in practice was that for a long time we just thought we had the 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 magnification setting was incorrect. We would take a picture, we would get the wrong result. We'd say we must have done something wrong with measuring how far apart these structures actually are on the on the image. So then we decided that we really had to fix this. We had to understand what was going on. We measured it really, really carefully. It was still incorrect. And if you overlay the two structures, you can see the relationship between them and you can see the discrepancy. And at that point, you say it's truly different. What could be going on? Do some calculations of the contrast in the microscope and the contrast in the STM. And it helps you to start thinking, you go off and do something else and the thought kind of comes into your head when you're not expecting it. So so you you end up doing this very complicated pathway that gets you to the answer in the end. And then you write the paper and say, oh, it's obvious why this was happening. But in fact, it takes a very long time. So I feel like science, you know, the way we are expected to write it up doesn't give a sense of the humanity involved, the fact that, you know, you were thinking about something else and suddenly you had this idea or you tried all sorts of stuff before you found the answer that, that was correct. And, and that was really the last thing you tried. So there's a lot of it that gets lost when we just write a paper and say, OK, here are the results. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So what technique do you use to deposit metals like gold or germanium onto the subject? Is aerosol okay. or liquid gels? Okay, so 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 this is a good question, and it depends very much on the material. So we have 
gold is very easy to evaporate. So you have to buy a chunk of gold, quite expensive, and you place it in a crucible made of carbon or boron nitride. And then you heat it up either with a little hot wire or with an electron beam that just hits it. And it gets so hot that it starts to evaporate. And the, the, if the, the process then requires that you have, so you have your gold in this little, little basket crucible. It's evaporating upwards and you have your substrate sitting above it. So that's what you do is you move the sample in and the gold is evaporating and it just sticks onto the surface. So the individual gold atoms are flying through the vacuum and landing on the surface. So this works for a lot of metals. If we want to do um, germanium and silicon, we have another option, which is to deliver them as a gas, which I showed on uh, in the talk, that there, there are certain gases like disilane and digermane, which consist of silicon or germanium combined with hydrogen. And they can be stored in a bottle. You buy a bottle of this stuff, you connect it up to your vacuum system, you leak it in very slowly, and those molecules will flow through the system until they hit a, a hot surface, has to be a few hundred degrees. When they land on a hot surface, they chemically break up, the hydrogen goes away, and the silicon or germanium is left behind. So that process of chemical vapor deposition is really good for semiconducting materials. So we can choose our process depending on the material, and we can sometimes choose different processes for the same material because you can evaporate uh, silicon or germanium as well. And it's really interesting to compare because for example, chemical vapor deposition, the sample has to be hot for this to work. But evaporation, it doesn't have to be hot. So now you can see the effect of sample heating on the structures that you form. So it's good to have choices. And it's really fun to have it like it's all yours to choose. So we built this system ourselves we have all the little parts for it. If we want to change something, we just unbolt something and stick something else on. And sometimes you buy a commercial system, it's so beautiful, you don't even want to change anything. So it's a bit more fun having an, a, a, an old system that you can play around with than compared to having something very shiny and new that, that you, you really don't want to touch in case you mess it up somehow. So, so we, we, we do a lot of tinkering with our vacuum system. That you just mentioned yeah. about uh, uh, the electron beam itself is an energy source. Yeah. How do you know what you are seeing is in part being influenced by the electron beam? Mm -hmm. That's a that is an excellent question, and it is true for not just movies in the microscope, but every picture you take from any microscope, like the one that's behind you now, um, the electrons that are used to generate the image could be affecting the sample. And so there are different ways of approaching this, but the basic idea is that you, you, you record an image when the beam is on, you do the same process, but have the electron beam switched off, and then you quickly take a picture at the end, and you see if that last image matches up with the last image of the movie that was recorded. So as an example for nanowire growth, we could record a movie of a single object growing and we say, okay, it's growing, it's growing. We know how fast it's growing. Let's turn off the beam for a certain length of time and then look back again. Did it grow the same length? And if so, we could say, oh yeah, the electron beam is not affecting the growth rate in this under these circumstances. So we can use that type of experiment to delineate when the beam is doing something important and when the beam is not very important. And <laughs> there's a kind of a simple rule that seems to work for us. If the process you're looking at happens at high temperatures, then the extra energy that comes from the electron beam is not very significant. If the process is room temperature, the electron beam is actually adding quite a bit of energy, so it's going to make a difference. And in that case, you still need to find out what's going on. You still want to study the problem. You do it by using very low dose of electrons. You turn the beam down as much as you can while still seeing the image you want. And you try to understand in, uh, in theory what the effects of the beam could be. 
Uh, you could maybe use different voltages. Uh, you could scan rather than have a, a single image. There's a lot of ways that you can change things around in order to get different beam effects. And then you can back out which is the beam and which is the natural process that you're trying to look at. Thank you. So mm -hmm. can you use uh, SEM to image the MORI superstructure? That's a great question. You, you can. Um, SEM is a very powerful technique. We tend to think of it as just looking at the surface of structures. But the electron beam on a scanning electron microscope does interact with um, the material. It goes in a certain distance depending on the energy. And therefore, it will interact with, with stuff that's at an interface below the surface. So we have, um, supposing we have two layers of material, even if they're quite thick, and there's a moray pattern, there's some kind of weird thing going on at this interface, but it's, it's somewhat down a bit. The electron beam coming in will go far enough down to interact with that structure, and then it will, uh, there will be scattered electrons, there will be secondary electrons. They do sense the buried interface. So you can record the structures. The resolution may be not as good as doing a, you know, high res, um, fancy transmission uh, image, but you can still see what's going on in in uh, parts of the sample beneath the surface using SEM. So it's it's actually a very versatile, flexible technique. Great, thank you. Uh, you mentioned yeah. about temperature, that how high temperature, you mentioned about like silver lower than gold. What's the temperature for gold and silver for growth of the silicon in a while? Okay. Yeah, so, so silicon nanowires grow with um, gold and silver catalysts around six or 700 degrees C. Um, they could grow all the way down to maybe 500 degrees C, which is still quite hot, right? But if you compare that with germanium growing with plain gold, that can happen at 200 degrees C. It's really low temperature. So there's a big benefit to having low temperature processing because it means you can... Um, make your film on something like a plastic substrate. Let's say you want to do electronics that's flexible, so you need a, a, a kind of polymer as the substrate instead of a silicon wafer. Then you have to build all these electronic components on top, and you can't heat up that plastic very hot, otherwise it, it's not going to um, do it any good. So in that case, you can you can push towards the lowest possible temperatures, but for growing silicon, it's, it needs to be a higher temperature. Maybe 500 is kind of a practical minimum. So it's not really low, but it still uh, can be lower than, say, deposition of silicon without a catalyst, which which needs uh, even a bit higher temperature. Yeah. I have the last question for you. Do you okay. think that is a feasible for this process to be extended to model biological process in organic okay. molecules. Okay, yeah, you're 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 probably think you're you're I'm I'm sure your question is thinking of the liquid cell microscopy. So if you have a thin sheet of water, can you have some little creature in there that you can image with the resolution of the electron of the transmission electron microscope? the time and the space resolution, um, which is so much better than what you can get with a light microscope. So there are, <laughs> the answer is that you can use these techniques for biological materials. We don't because we're lazy and we, we find normal, you know, inorganic materials to be a bit easier to work with. But biological materials can be imaged in water using liquid cell microscopy with with one problem that the electron beam does have a strong effect, especially when it hits water, it creates a load of chemical reactions. So if you had a, a living cell or a, or a bacterium or a virus, I guess, in water, when you put the electron beam on it, it's as if it was in the middle of a nuclear reactor. It's a really intense radiation field. So as soon as you take the picture, Whatever it was has died. It's no longer alive at that point. So you can't make a movie of some living 
creature performing in the electron microscope because the electron beam is so intense. But you can, for example, image biological materials at room temperature in water in their native water environment. Um, and that makes a big difference compared to cryo-electron microscopy, in which you get fabulous images of biological materials, but you had to freeze them in order to, to uh, reduce the beam damage. So the thing that you're imaging is no longer in water, it's in ice. I know it's amorphous ice, so it's not bad, but um, it's in ice rather than water. It's not moving, it's a static image. So there is a a, a space there for liquid cell microscopy to be used for uh, biological problems that is definitely being explored and um, has all kinds of fun possibilities. Like you can do correlative microscopy between biomaterials in an electron microscope and in a light microscope. You can use all these techniques of fluorescence and labeling and you can get really unique information. Um, so it, there's, there is a niche for it, and it does it does have some really great possibilities. Great, that's right. Thank you again for being our guest speaker tonight, and yeah. also thank you all for attending tonight's event. If you have any more questions, please directly contact Dr. Russ or send an email to physics at hamlin.edu. Right. And, and, and I'd like to just like to say before we finish that it, this has been a real pleasure. It's such an honor to have this chance to, to share what we do with, with, a, with a wide audience. And I loved that contribution from the students at the start. I think using spinach to make uh, photovoltaic cells is a fabulous idea. And it's great to see all that enthusiasm and, and research that is going on. So um, thanks to the students. That was really fun. <laughs> thank you. Right. Yeah. Good. And also for the audience, thank you again. If you are more than, you also is more than welcome to visit and utilize our research facility at Hamlin. Thank you. Good night. Okay. All right. Good night. <laughs>